Okay. Uh, well, good evening to everybody. I'm delighted uh, to be here and I welcome you all to uh, the event, an industrial strategy for the green economy. Um, this is the uh, culmination of the LSE's Environment Week. We've, the whole week we've been having a rich cornucopia of academic presentations, masterclasses and events like this evening. And this is the highlight of the entire week. Um, we have a, a fantastic group here, but before I introduce them, uh, I just want to, um, you know, my name is John Van Rienen. I'm the uh, Ronald Coase Professor here at the LSE. Um, I'm also the um, Director of the Programme on Innovation and Diffusion. POID uh, were sponsored by the Economic and Social Research Council, who have helped uh, fund this event, so thank you uh, very much to them. Um, and I just want to cover a couple of housekeeping items, a bit boring things, but important. So um, the discussion's being live-streamed, and we are being so we're being recorded. It'll be made available as a podcast and a video, subject to no technical difficulties. Um, we're going to have designated time towards the end of the panel discussion to answer questions from the audience, in person and those connected remotely. Um, those who are joining us online can type in their questions in the Q&A box, and my colleagues will make sure to pass them on to me. Um, please be sure to include your full name and organisation affiliation. And uh, please feel free to contribute to the conversation online by using the hashtag hash LSE Environment Week. And for those people in the room now, can I ask you to put your phones on silent mode to avoid uh, disrupting the event? So, um, you know, this is a really um, exciting uh, time to be having this discussion over uh, industrial policy, particularly around the, the kind of green transition. And we're very fortunate enough to have um, kind of four outstanding uh, speakers coming from um, quite different perspectives. So um, we, are, we have Heather Boucher, who is the, uh, uh, a member of President Biden's Council for Economic Advisors, uh, who's one of the you know, leading thinkers of industrial policy and in, in putting it in practice as we've seen on the Inflation Reduction Act, which is you know, part of the whole context of this discussion we're going to have today. Um, we have Ed Miliband, who um, he needs no introduction, but he, he's the, uh, an MP, the Shadow Secretary of State for Climate Change. Um, I think I've known Ed for 20, probably longer years since he was a special advisor uh, to Gordon Brown. Um, and we have Arkebi uh, Akrobe, who's a former senior minister and special advisor to the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. So we're going to have perspectives from... United States, from the United Kingdom, and also from, from Ethiopia. And then finally, but not least, um, my Deputy Director, Anna Valero, uh, who is uh, a Distinguished Policy Fellow at the Centre for Economic Performance. Um, the structure we're going to have is Anna is going to lead us off for a quick five-minute overview of the, the kind of issues, and then each of our, our three uh, distinguished uh, panellists has up to 15 minutes each to set out their stalls, We'll then have a, a moderated discussion and Q&A from, from the audience. So without further ado, I will hand over to Anna for the overview. Thank you very much, John. And it's really my pleasure to be here this evening to talk about such an important topic. So I think as we've all, we've all seen around us, industrial policies have been on the rise in recent years. Um, either explicitly as part of stated government strategies or plans, or in response to shocks and transitions, which we're seeing all around us. Industrial policies mean different things to different people, and we had some discussion today about the definitions. A def definition put forward by Danny Roderick, which I also really like, um, is that industrial policies are those that involve interventions that seek to change the structure of the economy in order to achieve a key goal, and that goal is typically growth-related. So green industrial policies can be thought of as the set of policies that are targeting green growth. These are increasingly being adopted, given the urgency of tackling the climate crisis and the recognition that to get to net zero by 2050, we really need rapid and very large-scale change across the economy and its systems. And this change centers on investment and innovation. The IEA sets out how we need to get to four trillion annual investment, and currently we're about 1.3 trillion globally. This is a massive increase. So a lot of this is expected to come from the private sector, and therefore we need policies in place to create the right incentives for the private sector to invest. In the US, the Inflation Reduction Act has committed large-scale and also long-term 
Government support to specific clean technologies and sectors, and this is seeking to crowd in that um, very substantial private sector investment. The EU is responding to this with its Green Deal industrial plan. We await the full policy response here in the UK, where recent years have seen quite an on-off relationship with industrial strategy, um, and also whether there are concerns about us falling behind on our um, ambitious climate goals. So net zero inv investments are very attractive investments in many ways. In addition to addressing the climate crisis, which we know is urgent, they can improve our energy security, our resource efficiency, and generate a variety of co-benefits such as cleaner air and all the associated health outcomes. However, if we just leave it to the market, the transition isn't going to happen, and this is because of the presence of many market failures and past dependencies, which imply that, yeah, we need a strong and coordinated set of incentives in place. Of course, the obvious market failure we'll be thinking about here is the greenhouse gas externality, which provides very strong economic justification to have carbon tax, regulation, and standards. And such levers are crucial environmental policies, which shape the incentives of investment. So you could say they are part of a green industrial policy. But of course, they're quite difficult to implement at the scale and the pace required. So therefore, many governments are looking to other tools as well. But of course, those other tools are justified by the presence of further market failures and barriers. For example, um, there's issues to do with R&D spillovers, where analysis has shown that clean technologies generate more externalities than their dirty counterparts in transport and electricity sectors. For example, imperfections in capital markets, the need for complex coordination of networks and systems, which really means government needs to get involved. Information frictions for consumers, for investors, for workers, and the public goods associated with net zero investments, such as cleaner air and resilience. These point to a broader set of levers across tax, R&D grants, finance, risk sharing, catalytic capital, public infrastructure investment, skills programs, and information campaigns. And also, there are significant policy barriers in the way. So in the UK, for example, our planning system is creating barriers to the crucial investment we need. So if we think about all these policies, actually, we also need them to be coordinated and part of a greater kind of whole. Um, so ideally, as part of a sustainable growth strategy. And that's where kind of institutions, monitoring, evaluation are all really important. Um, OK, but if we agree that we need these different policy levers, there are a number of challenges that are in, in play in specific countries or places. So first, how can a country identify which sectors or technologies to be focusing on? In advanced economies, this challenge relates not just to what's crucial for your own net zero journey, but also if you're innovative and have strengths in your innovation system, how can you think about where your comparative advantages lie so you can actually try and access on the growth opportunities associated with growing global demand? So taking the example of the UK, actually we're primarily a service-based economy. We have strengths in a lot of services such as green finance, design, consultancy, which are relevant for the net zero transition. And we also have strengths in a number of green technologies such as tidal stream, offshore wind, um, and CCUS, carbon capture usage and storage. So how can we try and ensure that we build on the strengths we already have and make sure we have the, the deployment of the technologies which we need? And of course, there are areas where we're not necessarily specialised, but we know we need to have capabilities for broader security or resilience purposes. And a key example would be that if we want to have any manufacturing of car industry in the future, we kind of need the gigafactories. So there's been a lot of kind of focus on that recently. Um, of course, for lower income countries, there's the whole... The, the imperative to develop, to industrialise, which can have synergies with decarbonisation, but also trade-offs in certain contexts. So understanding those, addressing those, and also all with, with large-scale adaptation backgrounds in the background is particularly challenging. So very quickly, my second and third set of challenges. The second one is your choice of policy levers really depend on your context too. So, of course, economics can shed light on which market failure or distortion is at play and which lever you should use to address that. But, of course, the different market failures and barriers interact, creating complexity. And politics comes into play in terms of what's feasible to do quickly. So, while the UK can learn a lot from the Inflation Reduction Act, and I hope it does, we also are a much smaller economy. We are under significant fiscal constraints. Um, and also, actually, on the plus side, perhaps we have more political ability to use other levers, such as regulation and carbon pricing at the national level. And finally, the last set of challenges relate to public support, which is just so crucial for enabling and driving the net zero transition. 
Like other periods of structural change, the net zero transition will create losers, winners, but we need to understand the distributional impacts and make sure we address them. Some communities will oppose net zero infrastructure in their locality. Some workers will be displaced and find it hard to adjust. Some households, particularly in a cost of living crisis, will find it really hard to afford the upfront investments associated with energy efficiency, heat pumps and electric vehicles. We've seen an example with the ULES expansion in London about how the concerns of a small group can actually really affect the national policy debate. So how can we make sure that net zero green industrial policies are communicated and understood as part of a broader vision that is also understood to be fair? So having scratched the surface on a number of these issues, I'm going to hand over to our distinguished guests to hear more. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I am thrilled to be able to follow you, Anna. That was, um, I feel like I'm going to give you a case study of everything you just talked about, I think, in action. And thank you, John, so much for inviting me here today. Um, really very happy to be able to talk to you. So I'm going to give you a quick overview with some slides, which if um, folks can have after, so I'm not going to go through all the details, but a quick overview on what we are doing, why we are doing it, and how we are doing it in the United States with respect to our industrial policy. And I think it's important to ground this conversation in how we got here, which is that when the president took office, we were facing a series of crises, both the immediate crisis of the pandemic and the recession, but also long-term structural challenges. Uh, the United States, like other countries, facing a rising cost of climate change, the damages that are being wrought across our economies, um, so the rising costs. But on top of that, long-standing challenges of economic inequality. This figure I'm showing on the right is one that I know is really important to President Biden, that for too long in the United States, we've seen productivity gains outpace wage increases, meaning that something had shifted in our economy. Workers were no longer benefiting from economic growth. On top of that, um, we, we saw that we were not resilient to the kinds of shocks that we saw during the pandemic. Our supply chains were fragile, and we're entering sort of a new geopolitical climate. So we started with these challenges, and the president during the campaign and through governing talked about how we didn't just need to build back from the immediate emergency of the pandemic, but that we needed to build back better. We needed to address these structural challenges even as we acted boldly to address the challenge in front of us. And so I want to talk about um, you know, what that means, what it means to build back better, and what we are now calling Bidenomics. So um, over the, the first um, two years of the president's uh, term, the United States, um, you know, in partnership, the president in partnership in a bipartisan way, much of this with Congress, has passed some of the most significant investment legislation that we've seen in generations. So it started with the um, American Rescue Plan, which was a $1.9 trillion injection into the economy to deal with the immediate crisis at hand and to lay the foundation for long-term growth. And so the other three bills that I've put up here, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act, are all pieces of making uh, investments in foundational infrastructure across the United States and supporting um, targeted sector-based investments in the new technologies that are important to our national and economic security, in the, you know, the cutting-edge technologies of semiconductors, but so importantly, the transition of um, you know, the challenge of building uh, a clean energy economy, where if we look out into the future, you know, energy is in everything that we do, right? It's the lights, it's the way that we build everything. Making this enormous transition that we need to make to build a clean energy economy is going to have significant economic repercussions for productivity, for growth, um, and for kinds of jobs that we have um, across our country and across others. So we were really focused on making this um, sector-based approach to expand the capacity of the U.S. economy to make productive investments and to make sure that we were doing it equitably. One of the fundamental things that the president talked about when he took office, and he had a press conference in March of uh, 2021, where he talked about how he wanted to change the economic paradigm. And that's really what I'm talking about here. What did he mean by that? What is Bidenomics? Well, it starts by recognizing that what we make and how we make it matters. It matters for economic security. It matters for national security. 
And so the first pillar of binomics is investing in America. And so those are those, those laws that I just put up here. These are the investments that we are making. So how are we making those investments? What does it look like? Well, I want to start with the basic point, which is that we don't have a choice about whether or not to invest in clean energy. We've waited so long that climate change is upon us, and now we have to do it. And um, especially because I'm here in London, I'm not in the United States, I wanted to start with this chart. This is a chart um, based on data from the International um, Energy Agency, Association A, whatever the A stands for, um, about projected and targeted um, uh, and target global installed manufacturing capacity um, for 2030 for what we need for solar PV, wind, hydrogen, heat pumps, and, and batteries globally. We have done in the United States historic legislation, more money than we've ever spent before on clean energy, and it's a drop in the bucket. Right? We are just at the beginning of making these investments here and globally. Right? This is, we are on the cusp of a global investment in these clean energy technologies, and there's a lot more to do. But we don't have a choice as to whether or not to do this. We can, um, I think, talk about how economists, I'm here at the London School of Economics for you know, much of my life, economists talked about how the right way to do this was through a carbon tax, and then we could distribute the gains of that tax and make people whole. And that's a fine idea. But the reality is, is that energy is in everything. And so that's always going to be a path that increases costs for families and for businesses. And if there's not something else you can buy, you're in a pickle. Really, the problem with clean energy is that there's not enough of it, and what there is is too expensive. It's not, I mean, it, emissions are a problem. But until you've created a solution, it's really hard for people to get on the boat to say, oh, I really want to do this new thing, because they don't have an option to buy a different kind of car. There's not an EV charging network. Why would they buy an EV electric vehicle? So we have to make these investments to make it possible for people to make this transition. And we all know how urgent that is. I don't need to convince anybody here. So um, what we are doing is focusing on a whole, a whole of government, modern American industrial strategy where we are investing on both the supply and the demand side. And we are making these investments in order, and, and I'm just, everything that Anna said, in order to crowd in private capital. Um, the amount of money that, um, and I have a different chart I swapped out for this one because I think this is more, more compelling, but public dollars are going to make a dent in this, but really this has to come from private capital. It's way too big for governments to do. We need to crowd in private capital from other things that it's doing because this is really important and this is what's going to enhance productivity and growth in our economies. So the way that we're thinking about it, there's a lot of words here. I just want you to know that there's a lot of words here. You don't need to read them all. But this is a chart that shows that how we are making investments through the bipartisan infrastructure law, through the Chips and Science Act, through the Inflation Reduction Act, in a host of things on the supply side, from the innovation to commercialization pipeline. And we're not just focusing on R&D, we're recognizing the market failures all the way along that pathway and that firms need a little bit of help to get through that valley of death, to get to commercialization at scale, which is the only way that we're going to make these things at scale um, at the, at this, at the uh, amount that we need. And we are also sending strong demand signals to consumers. We're giving all sorts of tax credits for not just electric vehicles, but for heat pumps and all sorts of clean energy technologies and through government procurement so that investors know the demand is there. And I think when we write the economic history books in the years to come, I believe, a hypothesis, that one of the most important things we've done is send that strong demand signal to investors, this is the path we're on, and there will be a market there. So if you invest in, a, in building a hydrogen thing, that demand will be there for decades to come. I'm just still an economist. I'm not totally an expert on all things hydrogen. I'm trying. Um, so, And we are also doing really important things like solving all the coordination fields. Not all, but the ones that are the big and, and, and the important ones. And the one that always comes to mind for me is electric vehicles. It's really hard for car makers to say, I'm going to make all these electric vehicles before somebody has invested in the electric vehicle charging network. I live in a really big country. We have span a continent. We need a lot of EV charging stations. Once you've made those, it's a lot easier for the consumer to know that they have access to what they're going to need. So we needed to do a yes and. We needed to do both. There's a chicken and egg. And that's where government can really play a role. Um, and all of this is in the, in the, to the goal of unlocking that private capital. So that's the first pillar of Bidenomics, investing in America. The second pillar is that we are focused on educating and empowering workers um, to create economic opportunity. 
So we are, um, in everything that we are doing, we are making sure that we are investing in job quality, that we're making sure that we are making it possible for, to do what we can from the executive branch side for people to join a union. Um, we are investing in um, uh, apprenticeships and workplace skills. I was just in Germany you know, learning a lot about you know, how they think about apprenticeships. We've learned a lot from them. And really making sure that we are rebuilding and strengthening local communities using place-based policies. Uh, we have a, 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 a Justice 40 commitment to make sure that the dollars that we are spending go to the communities that need it the most. And we have commitments to our energy communities to make sure that they are helped as we make this transformation of our economy. Um, and regional um, programs like the tech hubs that are designed to foster regional economic development. So we're making these investments, but targeted, really making sure that we are empowering people and places. The third pillar of Bidenomics that is so important and I think often gets short shrift, um, and as an economist, I often think that this is, this is one of my, they're all my favorites, but I do really like the third one, which is shaping markets to be fair and resilient. So for too long in the United States, we let markets do what they wanted to do without actually enforcing the laws that we'd had on the books. We, the United States was an early leader in um, what we call antitrust enforcement, making sure that markets aren't concentrated, that they are fair, that there's room for innovation and opportunity, and that can help make markets more resilient in a variety of ways. And we, the, the president has really focused on making sure that competition policy, um, fair markets, is a core part of his agenda. And this is really important in energy. Throughout my life, um, we've seen how the concentration of oil production affects global markets. You know, OPEC controls about 40% of the world's crude oil supply, and we know how much power they have over global prices. We also know as we build this new clean energy economy, we need to make sure that we have markets that are shaped to be fair and open and competitive where there's a variety of producers. And right now, core parts of the clean energy supply chain are dominated by one country. Um, upwards of 90% for core parts of that, um, you know, solar panels and different pieces. And that's not going to help us be resilient over the long term. And we all learned during the pandemic how important resilient supply chains are. So that's the other piece of shaping markets, to not just be um, efficient, but to also be resilient. And we're doing all of this, of course, alongside our friends and allies, making sure that we are thinking about um, the, uh, our role in the global trading system, we believe that because we are making these in big investments, it will help lower costs, get to commercialization at scale. This will have benefits around the world. We also are finally, the United States has finally stepped up and been the leader that the world needed to make the steps we needed to make to address climate change, to do our part, and are trying to work with our friends to encourage everyone else to do what they need to do. And politics plays a really important role here. We can talk about that in the Q&A, if folks would like. So I want to end on the progress we've seen. So I have three slides here. I'm going to go through them very quickly. This is inflation-adjusted private manufacturing construction spending. So we're trying to crowd in private capital. And here's what we've done. 1964, 2022 into 2023. This number has spiked. We have seen a sharp, skyrocketing increase in the construction of manufacturing facilities in the United States since the president's plans were um, put in place since they started to be announced. Second, we have seen this contributing. Would you like to take a picture? OK. Um, you just, your, your face looks so sad there. Um, I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, we've seen this contributing to economic growth. And so um, what this shows is that the contribution of private non-residential investment in manufacturing to the contribution to real GDP over time. And you can see that it's higher than it's been in decades. So a significant increase in that investment is actually helping our economic growth. And finally, and this is where I'm going to end, when the president, um, the president has made an, a number of speeches and comments where he said, when I hear climate, I think jobs. He doesn't just think jobs. He thinks good jobs all across the United States. There are so many maps that I could show you. My colleagues and I are obsessed with all the maps that we've been made showing the success of these policies already. We've just celebrated the one-year anniversary. Already, we've seen $511 billion in private sector investments in semiconductors, clean energy, electric vehicles, batteries, and manufacturing across the country. This is just batteries, solar, offshore wind. Um, because I wanted you to see that this is all over the United States. 
And in fact, um, recent analysis by the Treasury Department finds that these investments are disproportionately going to places that um, need it the most, where growth is slower. And that also means that uh, that has political consequences, which we can talk about. But for the president, it's very important that we have an economy that delivers for all of America, that we no longer have an economy that only delivers for those at the top of the income distribution and for just for some places across our country. And so trying to deliver not just on the clean energy transition, but doing it in a way that delivers equitable growth has been the goal. And we're only a year in, but I think we're doing okay. But it's, you know, it's going to be a lot of work. So with that, I'll hand it over. Thank, thank you very much, Heather, for a superb presentation. Um, and you know, the Inflation Reduction Act really is an extraordinary piece of legislation, probably the, certainly the biggest piece of legislation in America against climate change and maybe in the world. So I you think know, that's a fantastic achievement. So Ed Miliband, over to you. Thank you. Um, th <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks very much, uh, John. And, and I just want to say it's great to be uh, on this panel at the LSE, and I particularly want to say... Uh, how great it is to be here with Heather. Heather is a very modest person, but the whole argument, which you, I hope, will have heard around middle-out economics versus trickle-down economics is something that really Heather has done more than anyone to not only advocate for but pioneer, and now she's doing the remarkable thing of not only having the theory but putting it into practice uh, in her daily work. So it's a real pleasure to have you uh, here and to be sharing a panel um, with you and your presentation was great. I, I want to make a, uh, a three-part argument, uh, which starts where Heather started, actually, which is we face, first we face two interlocking crises of our economy, and this is a decades-long crisis, uh, and climate, which is apparent for all of us to see. And the right will tell you that if we want to um, improve our economy, we can't tackle the climate, uh, and they're wrong. Uh, secondly, that Britain has actually that no country is doing enough uh, to tackle the climate crisis. Britain has actually done better than, than some. But my argument is not we just need to do more faster in Britain. We need to do it differently, and we need, and I'll say something about what I mean uh, by that, if we're going to take up the green industrial policy that Anna talked about at the beginning. Um, and thirdly, we should take big inspiration from Bidenomics and IRA. And I think I want to sort of, in, do, in a way, do a little bit of rebuttal on uh, the U.S. administration's behalf around some of the critique uh, that you might have heard uh, of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, look, first, I just want to say something about the, the economic challenge. I represent a constituency at Doncaster North, where I was uh, today, uh, ex-mining constituency. It voted by 72% for Brexit. They didn't listen to me uh, when they <laughs> made that decision. Uh, it was just after Brexit, I went to the US and people said to me, oh, Hillary Clinton's definitely going to beat Donald Trump. Uh, and that didn't turn out well. Um, and look, in a way, tonight speaks to that issue um, because the loss of good manufacturing jobs in a constituency like my next mining constituency was a very, very big part, much bigger than you might think of why people voted uh, for Brexit. And there's a sort of really important, I think I can say this at the LSE, there's a really sort of important thing to have in your mind, which Gene Sperling, one of Heather's predecessors, once said to me when he was talking about trade. He said, look, and this is maybe the kind of a bit of a rebuttal of the LSE, really, uh, or some of what's taught at the LSE. He said, look, the gains from trade that you will hear talked about uh, in your classes at the LSE are narrowly spread. So they're spread across the whole population. But the penalties from jobs being offshored are deeply focused on particular communities. And I think that's such an important explanation of so much of what we've, just having that in your mind is such an important explanation of what we've seen. And, and you know, for reasons of kind of economic justice, for reasons of supply chains and ethics in supply chains, for reasons of national security, I think the experience of the last three or four decades and what's loosely called neoliberalism should make us sort of rethink some of our assumptions. And I think ex implicit or explicit in the Inflation Reduction Act, explicit, I think, is rethinking those uh, assumptions. That's the sort of economic side. I just want to say something about climate because John mentioned you know, some of the issues around costs and climate. 
it's really important to say this, it's cheaper to save the planet than to destroy it. Uh, I mean, Nick Stern showed that 15 years ago. He showed in the long term it was uh, the costs of inaction were greater than the costs of action. But it's not just true in the long term anymore. I mean, in the case of the UK, not so much in the US, renewables are multiple times cheaper than fossil fuels. So it's, climate is not the expensive choice. Of course, there are costs of the transition, but it isn't the expensive um, uh, choice. So that gives you some sense of, of kind of why I think that the kind of rights view of, the, of economics and climate is wrong. And, and it's also right to say that, as the president has said, this is the big economic opportunity. Tackling the climate crisis is the big economic opportunity of the 21st century. $5 trillion a year of investment that the IEA say that we uh, need between 2030 and 2050. Secondly, why, why shouldn't we just do kind of more of what the government's done, but better without you know, some of the uh, screw-ups uh, that, that, that we've seen uh, from then? I want to talk about offshore wind. Because offshore wind is actually a British success story in some sense. We're the second biggest generator in the world of offshore wind after China. We've led the way in uh, many ways. But we haven't secured the jobs from offshore wind in the UK. I just want to talk to you about floating wind, which is a new technology in offshore wind. Let me tell you about the floating wind prototype. And I think we've, we've got the largest prototype in the world, and government ministers talk about this a lot. The foundations were made in Spain. It was then loaded onto a barge taken to Rotterdam, where the turbine was attached, and then it was towed into Scotland. And then get this, when it needed maintenance this year, it had to be towed back to Rotterdam for the maintenance. So they didn't do the maintenance uh, in Scotland. I went to the largest onshore wind farm uh, in the uh, UK and Wales, uh, in England and Wales, um, and um, it's 100% owned uh, by a company called Vattenfall. Vattenfall is 100% owned by the Swedish state. So contrary to what you might think, we have a lot of public ownership of our energy in Britain. It's public ownership by foreign governments. Ha nearly half of our, I get this, nearly half of our um, offshore wind assets are owned by foreign governments, by companies that are state-owned from other countries. Now, wh why, what's the sort of floating, I think this goes to the heart of the industrial policy question. Why have we... Why is the floating wind not being built in uh, Britain? We've got no proper industrial policy, or we decide we want one and then we don't want one. We haven't invested in our ports, so our ports aren't just simply aren't fit for purpose for uh, renewables. And that's, it is so interesting, this, because this is a mar an obvious market failure. No company has deep enough pockets or has a financial incentive to make that investment in the ports. So the investment doesn't take place because government in the UK doesn't say, well, it's not really a job for us, or it's a job for us, but in a very small way. And so the ports aren't renewable ready. There's no proper incentives to build it uh, in Britain compared to other countries. And we have no national domestic champion. You know, we have EDF from France, we have Vattenfall uh, from Sweden, we have Allstead, the Danish state-owned company, and we have Statcraft, the Norwegian company. We don't have a British version. We don't believe in that um, uh, here, in, uh, here in Britain. Um, so it's not mysterious why the jobs haven't been built in Britain. And by the way, it's not just floating wind, in case you wondered. It's all of the offshore wind and all of that. And, you know, there's this massive wind farm, NNG, off the coast of Scotland. And all the, and there was a place that could have been, the jackets could have been made. And it, they, they're not made there, they're made elsewhere. So it's just a, it's a, I'm afraid it's a sad story of relative success in generation being kind of undermined by failure uh, when it comes to getting the jobs here. And, and we won't take people with us on this transition if we carry on like this. Because people will say, well, look, we're trying to transition out of oil and gas and, and fossil fuel industries, and you're saying, well, we can go and have the jobs in Denmark or, or the US or, or uh, elsewhere. And so this is the sort of thinking, this is my third point, which informs the, the policy program that we're going to put forward at the next election. I just want to say a few things about the way we think about that program. First of all, you need a clear North Star. I was Secretary of State in uh, between 2008 and 2010. We introduced the Climate Change Act, the 80% reduction now, now 100% reduction by 2050. Our North Star is going to be something very challenging, which is to have a, a, a zero carbon power system by 2030. It's going to require an absolute war footing to get there. That's not net zero by 2030, but as far as the electricity system is concerned, uh, uh, zero carbon. In case you're wondering, that involves doubling onshore wind, trebling solar, and quadrupling offshore wind. 
Secondly, it's really important to choose which areas, this is Anna's point, that we're going to succeed in. We can't succeed in everything. We're not going to take over the solar market from China. But we do have massive, massive geographical opportunities as a country uh, for carbon capture because of the North Sea, for hydrogen because of the North Sea. We actually have some leadership when it comes uh, to offshore wind, not, the, not, as I said, the manufacturer, but we do in the... Uh, generation. So we're going to choose areas where we think Britain has natural advantages. We're going to set up institutions uh, that can deliver. So GB Energy, we're, gonna, we're learning those lessons from other countries. A publicly owned energy company, which is, you know, what's that going to do? It's going to help to de-risk technologies that need to be de-risked, like innovative technologies like floating wind or tidal. It'll partner with local communities to build clean power in local communities and indeed the private um, uh, sector. So absolutely, as Heather said, crowding in, uh, uh, not uh, crowding out. And, and then as part of that crowding in, not crowding out, we will start to make the investments that we haven't made in the ports. So at least nine uh, renewable ready uh, uh, ports in green steel, because if we're going to have a steel industry, we need to help it transition in partnership with the private sector, in carbon capture, in hydrogen, and we will have a British jobs bonus, which says, look, if you invest in Britain, you will have an incentive to do so. Again, learning very much from uh, what the Biden administration has done, um, underpinned, and I think this is a crucial point, and I think it's such an interesting part of the US administration, underpinned by strong unions, because it's very interesting if you think about the fossil fuel industries, uh, certainly in the UK, they have strong unionization. And so to make this transition work and be just for workers, it's just non-negotiable that we have strong union access and role in, the, in, in this uh, um, future. So we want to do our own version of what Heather is doing in the US if we win uh, the election. I just want to come on to two or three final points. Some people will say, maybe even at the LSE, uh, this is protectionism, and it's bad. I don't agree with that. I think it's a very old-fashioned neoliberal view of economic policy, honestly. Um, and just to sort of say something about the fact that this is going to have positive benefits for the world, the biggest single change in the last 15 years, as far as I'm concerned, as well, apart from the fact that climate change is so obviously here and is you know, in many ways worse than people thought and quicker than people thought, is the extraordinary change in the cost of renewables. Solar down 89% in a decade, uh, offshore wind down 60% in a decade. For 90% of the world, at least in theory, uh, new renewables are cheaper than new fossil fuels. And that is a remarkable transformation. But that didn't happen by accident. That happened by the public sector and the private sector acting together to bring down those costs. It's in our interest for the US to be investing in these technologies because it'll help bring down those costs. It's in the world's interest for Britain and the US um, uh, to be, uh, to be uh, doing this. Just a couple of other points to emphasize about this. There's plenty of investment to go around. I mean, Heather showed the gap that still exists. Five trillion dollars, as I said earlier, uh, the IEA say we need. But, and maybe I'm hopefully a good segue to your presentation, it must be accompanied by reform to ensure that the cost of capital for developing countries means that that 90%, for 90% of the world, the renewables are cheaper, is actually real rather than theoretical. Multilateral development bank reform obviously being uh, a crucial part of this. Point I just want to end on is, you know, the most important reason we're doing all of this, um, which is the climate crisis. I was trying to get these figures. I'm sure someone at the LSE knows this. Um, but I, this is the figure I've got. In 1900, there were 300,000 horses on the streets of London. That was sort of peak horse, I think. Uh, uh, and everybody at that point, so I'm told, um, was saying, well, we're going to have horses forever. I mean, these horses aren't going anywhere. I mean, look how many horses there are. Uh, and within 20 years, there were hardly any horses left. And so, this is, I, I, I'm not just searching for a sort of reason to be cheerful. I I'm, I'm genuinely think this is a reason to be optimistic. We, draw, we tend to draw linear, we tend to draw straight lines and say, this is what the world's doing on the climate crisis, and this is what it's going to carry on doing. But something kind of remarkable is happening. The first terawatt, I think, of solar took 23 years to install, and the second terawatt is going to take three years to install, and the third terawatt less than two years. There comes a point, a tipping point, a positive tipping point, when 
suddenly people think, hang on, and it's so interesting that the IEA have said this week that we're going to reach peak fossil fuels uh, this decade, when people say, well, hang on, maybe the horses aren't the answer. <laughs> maybe we need something different and better. And when that thing becomes cheaper, that is a moment of opportunity. So look, I think there's a huge amount to fight for in this. And I think that genuinely, I think the US should be admired for what it's doing uh, and hopefully will, is, is helping to, to kind of propel a global movement that can transform all of our economies and indeed tackle the climate crisis. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ed, for an ins ins inspirational speech. And I think, you know, many of you, will get, you know, have known that Ed has been one of the uh, leading politicians very early on identified climate change as a major problem and is trying to do something about it. So a very forward-thinking leader in our political, in our country. So our final speaker is Arkabi. Um, so I'll hand over to you for the final, the final <laughs> presentation. Uh, thank you, John, for uh, inviting me to join these uh, uh, distinguished uh, participants. And uh, thank you for uh, the panelists. And uh, let me congratulate you for exceptional success uh, on this uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which is a classic industrial policy. Uh, and let me start with a story about La uh, LSE. When I was doing my PhD, I did my PhD at SOAS University of London, and my thesis was on industrial policy. Uh, and uh, and uh, now I'm also based at uh, SOAS, uh, British Academy Global Professor, uh, studying on green industrial policy. So I was looking for a book, a very, very important book by Alexander Hamilton. You wouldn't find it on Amazon, I couldn't find it at SOAS University of uh, London uh, Library. Then I came to LSE and I found it. That was a collection which was published in 1934. And, and, and uh, when I, I always remember about LSE, I remember always about Hamilton. So this is a typical uh, Hamiltonian uh, industrial policy I've been able to, to, to achieve. So I congratulate you. Uh, I would like to talk more about my continent uh, because it's so important uh, uh, and we have a lot to share. I would like to focus on three important points uh, which, has, which I believe are critical uh, and in the prevailing com conversation. The first one is should Africa uh, focus on carbon neutral industrialization because it's still at the lower, at the lower level of uh, economic development Industrialization is an ambition. Economic transformation is a challenge. So a key point here is what path should Africa follow? Should it follow carbon neutral or should it follow uh, the, the conventional or traditional industrial policy grows at the expense of uh, environmental uh, destruction? As uh, a second point, I would like to focus on just transition. We cannot only talk about green transformation without looking and discussing the political economy and the politics of uh, just uh, transition. And the third point, I would like to raise what are the critical challenges for Africa in terms of implementing green industrial policy. And I will try to uh, add some cases uh, to these issues. Yeah, and uh, I feel there are three important points we need to uh, look at uh, in order to uh, agree on why Africa should follow carbon neutral industrialization. Uh, first is the primary of economic transformation. We have seen during COVID uh, that uh, also economic recession that followed since the global financial uh, crisis. Uh, because of the inability of many African countries in terms of economic transformation, despite the moderate uh, average growth, and the multiple crises that have been following, economies in Africa have been quite vulnerable, and, and, and uh, the economic uh, situation has aggravated. So a key starting point is economic transformation is going to be central 
And the most recent uh, re re crisis also has shown us that economic transformation is quite an important aspect that really improves vulnerability of African economies. Second thing we need to look is at the prospect, at the future, is the dynamics in terms of demography. And here, uh, in up to 2050, uh, 800 million uh, new uh, uh, people will be joining in the workforce in Africa, 800 million. On average, we have to create 30 million jobs every year. Uh, it also has implication for productive capacity to pull and build industrial capacity in Africa. And also this means the growth of middle class and also growth of markets, and then urbanization. This is a second important driver we have to see because economic growth above all in the long term is influenced and shaped by technological growth and demographic uh, dynamics. And the third point is Africa does have an opportunity uh, to pursue carbon neutral industrialization for many reasons. First, old style traditional uh, industrialization is a dead end, it's no more to work. Secondly, the technology is advancing and we have seen in the last 10 years, the cost of uh, renewable energy has shrunk, has reduced from by about 90%. Uh, we see this across the board, EVs, batteries, in all uh, uh, also wind, wind farms. Uh, so the, this is an important opportunity for the continent to achieve its, uh, its industrialization. On the political economy of just transition is important from the perspective of developing countries, particular uh, Africa. And here I want to raise uh, some, some important points. The global, I mean, the top 1% uh, wealthy or economically well uh, part of the society emit 15% and contribute to greenhouse emission. Africa accounts 0.5% in terms of cumulative uh, greenhouse emission. And also the current level of uh, global green emission contribution of Africa is only 3 to 4%. So there is a disproportionate uh, situation here. We see uh, three uh, uh, elements here. First, the wealthy countries who have benefited from the long-term industrialization have accountability, and second, the higher income people. And the third element is the, is the fossil oil industry. The fossil oil industry is still reaping profits and from 1970, according to World Bank data, up to, 19, uh, up to 2022, uh, the total sp uh, the profits collected by the fossil oil industry is 50 trillion. And as we speak, in 2022, the fossil oil industry was subsidized $1 trillion. And about 5 to $6 trillion is also the estimated cost subsidy uh, to fossil oil industry. So here we see a contradiction. The political economy, the politics of fossil oil industry is not being touched. And it's obvious uh, the current status quo is not going to change. So it's important to address these uh, issues. And the key principle should be the polyester pace uh, principle, not just which countries or which economies produce, but primarily the consumption element. And also what matters is not the total uh, emission, but the per capita. And also we have to see uh, from the context of the cumulative uh, contribution. So here we need to look at Africa, if it has a big and green ambition, uh, the biggest gaps are finance, technology, and also the twisted international governance system. And these are quite critical uh, that need to be addressed. In terms of green growth, uh, the, uh, the pathway African countries, the pathway Africa can follow is not going a single path uh, because African countries are quite diversified. We have 54 uh, countries and, and, and the nature of economy from the perspective of uh, uh, even uh, greenhouse emission is quite different. 
So it has to be context specific, to the, uh, uh, related to the level of development, and also uh, it depends on the nature of each sector. So the starting point is to grow and clean is a dead end, and we need to start uh, on the uh, path to uh, neutral, uh, uh, carbon neutral path. Here I would like to highlight there are four categories or classification, if I say, if I may, in, in African economy. First, we have carbon intensive economies. Here, a typical country is South Africa. Over 80% of the country relies on, on thermal power. Uh, the second uh, aspect or the second uh, classification within our continent is fossil oil dependent economies like Nigeria, like Angola. And then we have natural resource driven economies and then we have non-natural resource-driven economies like Ethiopia or Rwanda. And all these cannot follow the same path, uh, and they have to adapt their uh, situation and reality. Here I would like to highlight, when we talk about green industrial policy, we have to be primarily concerned about the production side. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is the prime content, is that it's focusing on the on the on the, productive, uh, on the production and technology side. On the Europe, what we have, which still dominates an opinion, is this, uh, the carbon trading or the regulatory mechanism. And, and uh, the Africa should follow the path on influencing the, the production side, rather than looking at carbon trading or uh, market uh, regulations. Although this will be uh, complementary to that effort. On in terms of the green energy, uh, uh, from the green uh, industrial policy, I, first we have to talk about the energy aspect. But green industrial policy is not only about energy. It's about an array of industries, sectors. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of changing the whole paradigm. So here, when we talk about universal access, because there are 600 million uh, population, Africans, without universal access to power or to electricity, and also without access to uh, cooking, healthy cooking uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, we shouldn't try to look at that aspect alone. This by itself is a demand, a market opportunity to develop the production uh, capacity as well. We have also to uh, look at regional and continental integration in terms of uh, electricity uh, distribution. For instance, Ethiopia, Kenya, Djibouti, they are already developing a regional uh, grid system. Uh, and I would like to highlight that uh, green hydrogen, which has become now <clears throat> an important topic in Africa, and about the rare minerals, which I will be talking uh, uh, later on. Here, as we can see, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 48.4% do not have access to electricity. And economists published uh, low-carb annual electricity consumption per person, and the conclusion was Africa needs to consume more energy. And as you could see, a household fridge in the U.S. is, uh, in terms of per capita, Bigger than, uh, uh, bigger than a person uh, electricity consumption in Kenya or Nigeria or Ethiopia. Yeah, there are various ways that need to be addressed in terms of uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, energy generation, in terms of shift to renewable, uh, which I'm going to touch uh, later on. Here, as we could see, in general, the biggest contribution, uh, the biggest contributor of renewable energy here is hydropower. The current dominant narrative is about solar, about wind, but actually the lion's share in renewable, in renewable energy has been coming from uh, hydropower. Hydropower is a major source in the U.S., in many countries of Europe, in China, and in Africa as well. I'm raising this point uh, to relate it with the, uh, the model chosen by Ethiopia. Here is issues that should alert us. In 2015, the investment on renewable energy in Europe was 22 times of sub-Saharan Africa. In North America, it was 23 times. Within six years, the gap has widened 
and the investment uh, in Europe has become 41 times uh, and uh, North America 57 times. This should really uh, uh, raise an important issue on international equality, how we narrow down the, the gaps. There are 17 frontier green and digital technologies identified that are related with uh, green industrial policy. And uh, the analysis and study done by Anktar shows that African countries are already lagging and it's highly probable they will be losing the window of opportunity in grabbing or in leapfrogging in these technologies. Uh, and then rare minerals, which has now become an important uh, topic, geopolitical topic, is now a dominant conversation in Africa. Uh, but what we are missing is, first, the technology uh, that demands cobalt or copper or lithium or manganese, those which are now required in chips production or in wind energy production or solar energy production, are not going to stay there, and, and we are going to see a lot of disruption on the technology side. So we cannot expect this is going to drive the economies and the resources uh, uh, rich countries. The other aspect is the geopolitical dimension is also a critical uh, factor that will also influence the process. So we need to be aware about the opportunities, but we have to relate also with the threats that, uh, and, uh, and also the possible challenges uh, uh, that African countries can face. The green finance is a broken global system. And, and the most recent climate summit in Nairobi, one of the contributions of the summit has been, it has dwelled a lot on the, on the financial global uh, architecture. And, and, and President, uh, Kenan President has been mentioning that the global financial architecture needs to be uh, uh, transformed, and this is quite, quite important. Let's look at World Bank's contribution, for instance. World Bank's contribution is still the same 70 years back uh, in, in, in terms of uh, capacity. It has not expanded, it has not increased. And World Bank is one of the most important multilateral uh, uh, development banks that was expected to help African countries and developing countries. The requirement in terms of resources uh, 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 is to achieve at least a healthy growth in renewable energy is about four trillion per year. And from this, developing countries' requirement is about 2.1 trillion. And here, a lot of intervention would be required about concessional loans, South-South cooperation as well, development financing, uh, direct investment, green bonds, uh, and this is constrained with the debt stress and macroeconomic constraints many African countries have. Yeah, now we'll try to highlight, is it feasible to build carbon neutral industrialization or carbon neutral economy? I would definitely say yes, and I'm going to bring evidence. This is the biggest hydropower being built in Africa, 6,600 uh, megawatt, which is built on the River Nile. Uh, and this was entirely financed by Ethiopian government and, and also bonds sold to the public. But this is a major, a major investment the country made. Over six billion for the power generation, over two billion for the transmission uh, as well. Uh, Ethiopia has also been investing in wind farms. Uh, so far, three major projects have been uh, financed and the scale of each turbine has also been increasing. Uh, this is uh, a geothermal, uh, geothermal projects are also encouraged. These are all clean. This is the waste to energy being implemented, built in Addis Ababa. This is the waste uh, uh, disposal uh, landfill, which has been uh, converted to generate uh, uh, incineration plant. Yeah, so Ethiopia currently relies 100% on clean and renewable energy. 89% hydro 11% wind, but solar has not expanded because solar has not been able to, the cost could not decrease to the level of affordable energy produced by hydropower. And this has been used as an important instrument of industrial policy. In Ethiopia, the power, uh, the kilowatt hour uh, tariff 
uh, for factories has been three U.S. centers, and current price is four U.S. centers, a fraction of what you would find in many countries, and this has been an important tool to attract manufacturing investment. But Ethiopia's commitment on the carbon neutral is not only linked power generation, it's also on the electric powered rail systems because the end user electrification is quite important. Uh, these are industrial hubs because industrial ecosystem is quite critical for uh, low carbon industrial hubs. Uh, and, and, and these are some of the parks being built with a new approach, new generation, all are green industrial parks and low industrial parks, low carbon. This, the left one is, uh, has been financed by World Bank. This is a pharmaceutical hub in Addis Ababa. Here, as you could see, on the right side, an industrial park and a railway line, both of them green rail system and, and a low carbon industrial parks complementing for supporting industrialization. Yeah, so these are the points I would like to share. Uh, currently, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on uh, a research on the greening of African development, a grant uh, supported by the British Academy, and the main target this four-year project is to identify the evidence on the ground and how Africa can follow uh, the greening of uh, its economy. And the other one, the Oxford Handbook of, on the Greening of Economic Development is an ongoing project which will be published next year, and this is, has assembled global thinkers on green industrial policy to produce the green transformation is the path for way. Earlier, we have produced handbook on industrial policy and industrial hubs. Thank you so much. Fantastic to have a perspective on from Africa. Um, so before we get into the um, uh, audience Q&A. Um, I'd just like to ask the panel a couple of questions. Um, I'd kind of like to start off with Ed as the, the local, yeah. <laughs> the local person here. Um, the, the, yeah, the the last one. that was the video. One second. The, well, it's, it's five seconds. Five it's, seconds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Five seconds. Maybe we can put it on the, 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 the website afterwards. Yeah, there's, no there's a very nice video, <laughs> but I think, no, let, let's put it on the, on the, on the yeah, website no we hear. So um, I want to talk a little about, uh, ask about the politics of, sure. uh, of the green transition. I mean, the, you know, the, the context of this is um, there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a potential cost to people, and, and absolutely I agree that the, you know, there's a huge cost of not doing something. So that point is well taken. But we have seen recently, think about the uh, recent Uxbridge by-election, when that was surprisingly Boris Johnson's uh, former seat, which was uh, held by the Conservatives. And that was very much around the, um, uh, the local issue of the extension of the ultra-low emission zone. Part of the feeling was that you know, this might be a pushback against some of the um, policies that we need for the green transition. And there is a kind of worry that... The kind of quite strong consensus we've had in the UK, unlike the US actually, there's been a broad consensus about the need for the transition, might be somewhat fraying in the UK as people perceive the costs to be higher than they might have otherwise been. What, what's your sense on that, Ed? Are you, are you relaxed about I mean, that? Are you worried about look, that? I'd what two, should you do about it? Two things. It? One, if you look at all of the polling, the public, whatever voters they are, support action on climate but it's got to make financial sense for them during cost of living crisis. And personally, I think this is why I think the reduction in costs that we've seen of renewables, for example, is so important. Personally, I think that is much easier to achieve than it was 15 years ago. So in some areas, green is cheaper, like energy. Um, in some areas, it will soon be cheaper. So for example, electric cars are expected, I think the sticker price of electric cars are expected to be lower than the price of petrol and diesel cars by 2027. The lifetime cost is already pretty uh, competitive. And in other areas, there will be upfront costs, but that's about the role of government. Now, my fear about the Conservatives is that because they have this neuralgia about any kind of public investment in this, 
They can't deliver a fair transition, but I think we can. That's the first point. Secondly, I think it is true to say that they are flirting with what you might call sort of pound shop republicanism, uh, which is maybe they should become, maybe they should try and use climate as a culture war. Personally, I can't speak for America. I don't think it will work here because I don't think it's where the public, I don't think it's where the public is. And, and, and following that, just on the same point, Heather, I mean, one of the, I think, the positives about industrial policy is that people can see the effects of it. So you showed those maps of where much of the building is going on, and it's very spread out around the US. I believe most, it's more in Republican states than it actually is in Democratic states. So there is that linkage, which may be a powerful way of getting people to buy into, into, the, into what we need. However, you'll know if you look at the polling of you know, President Biden, that doesn't seem to be reflected in, in popularity towards him. Do you have any sense, is that just we have to wait and that's going to happen before next November? I, you know, obviously, there's the media type of issue, but it's also on the liberal left don't seem to be enthusiastic. Do you have any, any feeling why that is and what could be done about it? Yeah, I mean, let me say a couple of things. I mean, one of the things we've seen is that because these investments are happening all across the country, you have seen some unlikely bedfellows. I mean, remember, the Chips and Science Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law were bipartisan. Um, but you also think, see things like the governor of Georgia, who's a Republican, who's not um, uh, been a leader on addressing climate change, is very excited about Georgia being an energy capital, and really because they're producing batteries, and is really excited about the jobs that they are creating. Um, or you see a state like Texas, which again has been a, a traditionally Republican state, where um, you, they are a leader in clean energy development. Texas has long been a leader in energy, and people in Texas get that if they want to remain an energy, uh, an energy leader, they need to make the transition. I think it's many of the things you talked about with Scotland, they're thinking about hydrogen, they're thinking about wind. Um, and you know, it was the, actually the, uh, the introduction of all of the uh, new clean energy onto the grid helped it deal with a very hot summer. So they had that additional capacity that helped them get through it. But yet the politics are a little bit um, uh, challenging because it actually climate has been used as a as a as a uh, political wedge. Um, so I think you're right to point out that um, that it is challenging. But we have seen some really interesting examples of effectiveness because this is happening all across the country and because it's about creating good jobs. It's about investment. It's about building things in, in communities and, and things that are very important. Um, on the you know on the president's polling and you know whether or not this you know how how this looks, I mean the reality is is that we've lived through a very challenging economic period. Uh, inflation has been challenging. It has come down markedly, but that has certainly I think been top of mind for people as they go into the the um, uh, when they when they talk to pollsters. But the other thing we know, um, this was pointed out to to me by a colleague uh, who wrote about this earlier uh, this week or last week. The, you know, if you look this far into Franklin Roosevelt's uh, term uh, relative to where President Biden is and all of the enormous significant ac accomplishments he had done, people also were rather cranky um, because people don't know about them. I mean, I think that what's hard is that when you put trillions of dollars into an economy to change how, what you're producing, where and how, that's not, that's not an overnight fix. Yeah. And so we are spending a lot of time. Um, uh, the Invest in America cabinet is touring the country. Leaders are going out and talking about it. I find in every forum I go to, colleagues that I know, who I have enormous respect for, who are economists and well-informed, don't know uh, some of the bits and pieces because it's, it's just a lot to process. So I think that as we show benefits in communities, Energy is getting cheaper. Clean energy, is, I mean, it's getting cheaper. It will be le the prices will be they'll they will fall over time. Prices will be less volatile. This is going to benefit people. They'll find that their cars don't smell as bad. They're not as noisy. There's all of these benefits, but they're still coming around the corner. And I will end on this. Please remember, the Inflation Reduction Act passed last um, August, but if you are a consumer and you are getting a tax credit, that that's not that those have not come online yet. So if you bought an electric vehicle this year, you have to wait to get your tax credit. So I've heard journalists say, well, why aren't people buying more electric vehicles? I'm like, what we need to be focused on, I think, are the charts I showed you. Investors are starting to get it. They're investing. But you got, that's got to wait to filter through to how that affects 
you know, uh, people in the community that I came from. It's going to just take a little time. Okay. Oh, optimistic view. I am very optimistic. Um, so, let, uh, I, you know, I have to, as, as the LSA economist injects uh, some, some pessimism <laughs> or some realism, as we would say. So, everybody's very enthusiastic about industrial policy, but... We, there have been lots of critiques over the years of industrial policy. I've become more, more uh, favorable towards it, but there are the many criticisms. So um, one worry is um, over when you start uh, giving lots of subsidies to lots of firms. That creates uh, incentives to lobby, to have cronyism, to also be captured. So that's, that's one set of issues. Um, there's another set of issues which, you know, we touched a bit upon, which was on protectionism, um, the kind of Trump tariffs, which have more or less stayed where, where they are, the domestic content provisions of things like buying electric vehicles. Um, I can see the political arguments for that, but of course that may also have some negative effects on the overall trade pattern. So let, let me start with you, Akebi. I mean, given you know, Ethiopia has had a long experience with industrial policy, do you, how, have, how have you try to, in, in your country, protect against the risks that it becomes a way of firms buying influence and getting access to, to, to subsidies? The, the, the ensuring that incentives and supports are <clears throat> uh, being linked to performance has been always a critical challenge uh, in implementation of industrial policy. Uh, the bulletproof solution is always linking uh, outcomes with support based on what Amsden uh, mentions, reciprocity uh, uh, control mechanism. Uh, and one way that has been a uh, practical solution is ensuring that the companies that invest and benefit from the support are targeted on export uh, because exports, you can easily measure it. Uh, the other aspect uh, that uh, is usually important is ensuring that the supports given are uh, transparent. All has to follow laws. They have to be, the policies should not be flexible from company to company. They have to be a rule being applied uh, within the uh, same sector. Uh, so this is also a second point that could be uh, useful. But I should also bring, uh, uh, I, I would like to highlight that industrial policies, uh, from my research, even when the government gives adequate uh, attention and focus to various sectors, outcomes are going to vary across sectors. Uh, this is primarily because of influence of political economy uh, within that specific sector or the other sector. Additional, the industrial structure as well is quite important, the linkages. So when we assume about industrial uh, policy, we shouldn't expect that the outcomes are going to be uniform or same across uh, uh, sectors in particular. So Anna, I know you've been thinking about, in terms of potentially you know, British industrial policy and the institutions that we might need if we were going to have a, you know, another British, have you have any thoughts on this, 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 these issues? Yeah, I mean, I would echo those same comments. I mean, in a sense, so people familiar with the institutional landscape in the UK will know that we have some strong institutions governing some areas of economic policy, whether it's fiscal policy through the Office of Budget Responsibility, climate policy through the Climate Change Committee. Um, growth policy is something that doesn't really have its own institution. So there was an industrial strategy a few years back, an industrial strategy council. It wasn't a statutory body, but that was then disbanded. Labour have proposed bringing something back on a stronger statutory footing. But the idea is if you have... I'm talking here about productivity, more broadly growth, something that is a, another crisis in the UK we need to solve. But, you know, also echoing the other speakers, we want growth that is sustainable into the long term, and that has to be environmentally sustainable, and this whole net zero transition provides opportunities for growth. So the idea is to have stronger institutions to advise on the synergies between growth and climate objectives, where there are trade-offs, how they can be kind of attacked, um, but also, crucially, being a place kind of slightly independent, but 
having some public salience, having the media, people listening to what it's saying, advising, reporting on progress, setting out metrics to monitor, um, setting out frameworks for intervention, what, what are the various factors that go into government decisions to intervene in certain markets, being outcome-based, um, and being technology neutral where possible. I understand in the Inflation Reduction Act there is a transition towards technology neutrality as well. Great. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that in our... I mean, we've learned from so many other countries, and um, uh, many of the policies that we have are technology neutral. Uh, there's, there's been a couple ways we've thought about it. I mean, one is thinking that each of these sectors that we need to decarbonize has its own challenges, and so we need to think about each of them you know, individually and what are the specific you know, market failures that you need to solve. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. And second, when you think about the tax credits, they are, you know, the production, there, there's a set of production tax credits and investment tax credits that are moving, that had been not technology neutral, but are moving in that direction. And that's really important. Um, it's also not picking winners and losers with a large part of the policies in terms of which firms. It's, you know, it's a tax credit. Anybody can claim the tax credit. It's not, you know, we're not choosing one firm or another. Now, there are a set of policies, like the loans, um, pro, uh, the loans program office, that is um, you know, identifying particular gaps um, in early stage uh, technologies that need to get to commercial scale and sort of helping with those gaps in private capital. Um, but a lot of that is sort of thinking through where do we need to go? And so the way that I see it playing out in this administration is that you have some, a set of goals that we need to achieve and really trying to figure out how you can encourage private actors to move towards those. So um, folks uh, talk about this as government enabled, but private sector led. And so a lot of it, I think, is trying to really be true to many of the principles that you've laid out here, while also acknowledging that we can't be agnostic about the national security or economic security goals that we have as a country. And I think to my mind, that's one of the really big pivots. Um, so you're constraining what you want from economists in a different way than you had been in prior years. Because um, you are saying, we want clean energy, so we're going to try to do it the most efficiently. But we really are being clear about where we want technology to go. Are you downsized to industrial policy, Ed? I mean, not entirely flippantly. I'd say the world has had an industrial policy for the fossil fuel industry for you know, half a century at least. A um, and, and many a century, and many of the people who object to industrial policy sort of quite like the fossil fuel uh, industrial policy uh, when you think about subsidies to oil and gas. I mean, look, I think you're right to ask the question, and if it simply becomes a kind of subsidy race uh, where countries are sort of bidding up each other, that will be a problem. But I think there are some sort of reasons to think that that fear is overblown. And I, and I guess I'd say three very quick things. Look, first of all, if you look at IRA, lots of the things are not actually about we want the industry here. I mean, they are things like the clean energy deployment tax credit. So in other words, getting renewables, uh, getting solar and wind deployed, which is what we've had here, actually, uh, for 15 years. And we've done it through consumers. But there's different ways of uh, doing it. Some of it is correcting for market failure, which, you know, Investing in the ports in Britain is not sort of a, a kind of subsidy race. It's just having ports that could actually, you know, accommodate these very large wind turbines. And then, then sort of finally, on the question of sort of how do you manage these subsidies, I think you don't try and do everything, which was Anna's original point. And I, certainly for a country like Britain, that wouldn't be sensible. But also I'm interested in the idea of what's the return for government. So in the case of the US, they have loans. Uh, in the case of Britain, we can think about loans or equity stakes and other things that will actually have an upside for government. So it isn't simply a subsidy, but there's actually a, re a potential return for government. Great. OK, well, let's open things up. Um, Helen, um, you have some online questions that you, you want to have come in or have not come in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Christian von Fleming from Germany. Do you, want, do you want three or two or three? Or yeah, give, give us two or three. Uh, it says, generally speaking, what types of policies would typically have a relatively fast impact and qu uh, quick wins, but which would take longer and have a greater impact? Um, following on from that, Vijay Shrau, uh, apologies if I mispronounced that, 
asks, what is net zero anyway? It doesn't just reduce emissions. Is it just rich countries carrying on as usual? Does it keep rich countries rich and poor countries poor? And then Yusuf Fadakowski, who is an A-level student, so the question for all speakers, how can we meet our net zero target and transition towards a greener economy without disproportionately affecting low-income families? Who wants to take any of those on? Uh, fast impact. Um, I, I, can, yeah. um, I mean, I think there are lots of things where we know there are barriers to investment. There are firms wanting to make investments and there are barriers standing in their way, planning being one of them. Um, so that's kind of something you could just try and remove the barriers. We've had some progress on onshore wind in the sense now it, if one person um, objects, uh, previously you couldn't do it, that has been slightly relaxed, but it's still a whole process and there are lags. So one thing is there's investment, there's capital ready to be invested, let's remove the barriers. The other things are setting a direction. So, you know, as the Inflation Reduction Act, many of the things will take time to come through, but the sense of direction, the commitment, the time, the stability and, and the scale that kind of generates a lot of momentum around industry. And then just, you know, when we think about fiscal events, what are the fiscal um, incentives that could be implemented quite quickly? If we make capital allowances, this is incentives for investment, make that permanent, that instantly raises the, the kind of incentive for firms to be investing in capital expenditures, which we know is so important here. Well, let me add, add something onto that that I think is really important that I, I perceive is happening, and you tell me, because you're representing different countries and different views, but it does feel like we are in a moment where we are all trying to race to the top. And I think that this question of faster, more impactful, some of it is sending that really clear demand signal that we are making the shift. And I mean, I think Ed's right that we have for, I mean, I think a century in various ways mm -hmm. subsidized fossil fuels. We've fought wars over fossil fuels. We've all known that access to energy is absolutely critical. And Arkebis, your point about which development path, right, the, the, the path to the future is going to be in developing and producing these new, what I think of as manufactured technologies. And so there's fast, but it's exciting to see so many countries racing to keep up. So I, I agree with, with Ed's point uh, on the previous question about the subsidy race. I think we need to look at this a little bit differently than we would in different kinds of goods because we are talking about energy here and it's a new way of thinking about energy that's unlike before. This isn't energy that you just pull out of the ground, it's energy that you, that you create a technology to manufacture and a race to the top there to develop new technologies. You talk to some of these engineers and they, their eyes get starry with how much energy we'll be able to produce in the future when this thing that they're researching, we actually produce at a commercial scale. So, so, so that, to me, some of the faster, more impactful is about all of us having these conversations, sending that really strong demand signal to both public and private investors. Um, okay, and, so let's take some yeah. people from the floor. I saw some hands, yeah, Matt gentleman there. Can you say who you are, and can you keep the questions quite short so we can take a, a group of questions? Uh, hi, I'm Ty David. Um, it just f felt to me that this such an in industrial strategy, whether it's in the UK or the US or indeed in Ethiopia, is just completely talking over the heads of the people who really matter, who are the people who've got to implement you know, a, a new way of life on the ground. I didn't hear anything about decentralization. I didn't hear anything about the, local, the role of local government, of community organizations, or, or of community wealth building, which is a, you know, a strategy that, that's achieved a lot of popularity in the UK and the Scottish government and the mayor of London's adopted community wealth building. You know, it, can we have some tears in the industrial strategy, not just talk about macroeconomic levers? Gentleman at the front here. Yeah, Ben <coughs> Casey from London and Frankfurt. Um, I'd like to ask about the role of the private sector because it was emphasised at the beginning and at various points throughout that the private sector would have to <coughs> participate. A year ago, I was talking at a conference in Morocco, and I was interested by what Arkebi said about Morocco and Ethiopia, because there we were talking about green bonds. Green bonds are being issued by somebody the private sector is ultimately going to buy them, and we aspire to, whether they come from multinational banks, whether they come from governments. 
I wondered whether you could comment upon whether there is a role for green bonds, whether green bonds are indeed attractive, and if they are attractive, who are they attractive to? Thank okay. you. Thank you. A lady at the back in the white shirt. Hi. I'm an American coming in for a postgraduate degree. We've talked a lot about green growth. As you know from Kate Raworth's Donut Economics, that we cannot continue to pursue growth at all costs. Have you considered the role of degrowth strategies or strategies that would keep our economies in balance? And if so, what conversations have you had? Okay. And final question, uh, lady to the right with glasses. Yes. Yes, you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hi, my question's for Ed. Labour has committed to spending quite a significant sum on its green industrial strategy. Um, in light of rising interest rates and the cost of borrowing having risen significantly, has that changed? And is Labour still set to commit the same amount of money? Okay, so four questions. I'm going to give the Labour one to the Labour ban. So, Ed, do you want to uh, comment on that? Um, well, look, we've said we will phase in our 28 billion and ramp it up to 28 billion a year uh, by the second half in, in the second half of the Parliament. And I think it's absolutely the right thing to do for us to do this. I, one uh, document, or actually two documents, I would recommend is the o Office of Budget Responsibility Fiscal Risks Report, which is really good long bedtime reading, uh, <laughs> um, which talks about the dangers. And so this is the fiscal watchdog in the UK about the dangers of climate delay. They say delaying by a decade doubles the cost of climate action because you lock in high carbon choices. And if you don't act, uh, the debt to GDP ratio balloons by the end of the century, to something like 289% of GDP. So, you know, yes, you're right to point out the fiscal position uh, is a tough one, but we are, you are, we are absolutely right to make this. I, I think not making these investments is the imprudent, reckless choice, uh, frankly, given that the costs will be um, storing up. Can I just take David's question, because I think it was sort of important, which it, important I re respond to it. David, you are right about this. It's got to be top down and bottom up. There's a brilliant project in Bristol called the Lawrence Western Community Wind Farm Project, which is a group of people on a council estate who've got together to build a community wind farm. We, with our GB Energy Local Power Plan, I want to see 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 Lawrence Westerns. And we won't just be saying you can do it with your, both arms tied behind your back. We'll be saying we're going to finance it and make it happen. And I think you're completely right to say that to sort of make green energy a reality, it's got to feel like it's happening on the ground as well as at a big macro level. Degrowth, Arkaby, do you have any views? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, not, not much. I, Seems I, a bit I'm hard not, in I, Ethiopia. I, I, I am not an advocate of uh, degrowth. Uh, and and the, the logic is easily, uh, pardon? Uh, the, 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 uh, the rationale for degrowth it's, it's rooted in the idea that uh, economic growth and greening are not compatible. But we all know from practice that it's, it is possible and, and, and they are complementary. Uh, and investing in green transition is absolutely important. One point that was mentioned from online was can developed countries greening, uh, green growth be achieved without impacting developing countries. My point is, yes, it's possible. Yeah, in two ways they can influence positively what is happening in developing countries. First, accelerating growth rate. Now, for the last 20 years, global economies in sluggish uh, growth rate. So this is a huge stimulus that can contribute. But secondly, also by investment in green technology, more products are becoming accessible. The problem lies the global collaboration aspect on the just transition is being omitted. The politics and the political economy of this fossil oil industry is completely sidelined. But essentially, that should not have been the case. So it's both uh, fronts should be seen. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to grab a few more questions and leave it up to the panel which ones they want to answer. There's loads of hands in the air, so sorry I can't get to them. That gentleman there on the jacket has been very patient. But short questions, please. Uh, is to Ed. Um, the city, a mile down the road, is awash with money mm. trying to get in to green finance investment. 
the UK is 16th in the world ranking for issuing any kind of green bond, and we've not issued a single municipal green bond. But municipal bonds were invented by a Labour politician, Joseph Chamberlain, in Birmingham in 1874. Why can't you do it? Okay, great. Another green bond one. We'll have to get to the green bonds. Gentlemen, the black T-shirt here. Um, another question for Ed, sorry. Um, Anna talks about UK institutions with a lot of power, economic institutions. One of them's the Treasury. A lot of people would say that, well, not a lot of people, some people would say industrial strategies failed because of the policy power that the Treasury holds. Would you say the Treasury is fit for purpose and would you use it to deliver your industrial policy and strategy? What was your name? Sorry? What was your name? Tom. Tom. <laughs> uh, lady here. I'm oh, sorry, I'm uh, not going to be able to get to everybody. Hi, my here. name's Anshu. I graduated from LSC a few years ago in a social policy. My questions for all the panelists is about policy communication. Uh, now we're seeing in all the countries how everyone feels so strongly about climate crisis and everyone agrees fundamentally this needs to be solved, but it actually is being used as like culture war or like different, different ways by various political bodies and ways. And there's, there's a real... Uh, there's a real inaction or ability to tackle that, to, to tackle that messaging. And how do we convince like, people that it is actually, it, it's something which is achievable. Whereas we've seen in recent by-elections that by like a small majority of people, a minority of people, the thought process can really impact the national policy. How, how are you proposing to do that? Okay, the last one, the gentleman behind in the, in the blue jacket. Can you say who you are? Yeah. Hi, my name is Rolf Noll. I'm from Germany. The Green Party in Germany became under heavy attack um, as a Verbotspartei, uh, prohibit uh, or a ban party, and the far right uh, came up. So my question is now, if we assume that we cannot install a technocratic uh, policy, um, and if we assume that money is a catalyst in the system, have you ever thought about... Um, green money in terms of a DAO, a green DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization where I, I call it vector money. When the vector goes more towards green, you can earn more. Okay. And if it goes in the other direction, you earn less. So it's all about <coughs> behavioral science. You have to educate the folks instead okay, of... Okay, thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. So I think last words uh, from all the... And take on whichever question you'd like to take on. Heather, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I mean, so many great questions. I want to just, um, I, I want to take a few of these questions together. I, I think that one of, the, one of the, the realities here is that we know that climate change is real, the costs are high, and that it's damaging. I think it wasn't until the last couple of years where we really could see that because the costs of clean energy had come down so much because of public investments, that this other world wasn't just possible on paper, but it's actually achievable exactly. in a very, very short period of time. And so my comments, I mean, to some of the questioners over here about the, the effects on local or the donut economy is that I think we need to look at this all with new eyes, right? That, that addressing climate is about changing the way we produce things. And that really is about internalizing the negative externalities, to speak like an economist for a moment. And that's, that's where we need to be thinking about where our policy interventions are going. Not just punishing the bad, but, but saying there's a different world as possible, and we can build that world. And because we're starting from a different place, we can, um, we can make sure that as we are mining critical minerals around the world, and the US has been very focused on making sure that we are working with our partners and allies to say, we need to do this in a good way in a way that we are not violating human rights and labor standards, in ways that we are not creating more environmental de degradation. This is going to be the key to the future, so let's get this right in the first instance. So let's focus on that now. So there's a lot of questions that we should be asking ourselves. Where we, There's a lot of things we messed up in the path, past, but we're moving to a new energy system. So let's focus all of our attention on making sure we're creating good jobs, honoring what communities need and want, making sure that we're moving really quickly but bringing people along. That is... That is what I see my colleagues in the United States focused on each and every day. It's so exciting because we are bringing together some of the, the concerns over here around the local, how do you have community engagement, but how do you say this different world is possible, but it starts with, with acknowledging that we have to start from a different place. I mean, it's great questions, and I can't really do justice to all of them. Um, 
On the Treasury point, I mean, yes, the Treasury's been a big problem, but it's not Treasury civil servants, it's political leadership. I mean, it's easy to blame the Treasury civil servants, but it's, you know, the political leadership that comes from the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And look, honestly, if Labour wins the election, Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves will offer more political leadership as Prime Minister and Chancellor than any Prime Minister before on this, or ch and Chancellor before on this agenda. They're both incredibly uh, committed to it. I think there are issues about the institutions of government and how they work together on these issues. I want the Treasury to be caring as much about uh, carbon budgets as financial budgets. I don't think it does um, uh, at the moment. I just want to sort of make two other points in, kind of in response to the questions. Just on this um, point about sort of taking people with you, People will come with us if it works for them economically. I mean, that is the fundamental point here. And the great insight of what was called the Green New Deal and now Bidenomics is that you can't do climate without doing economic justice. And you can't do economic justice without doing climate. And they've, all, they've got to work together. Because if they don't work together, you won't take people with you and you won't deserve to take people with you. Last point, I, it very much reflects what Heather said and it actually relates to a previous question. Um, I think we need to think about this as a sort of wartime footing. Yes. You know, Germany built an LNG, LNG terminals in nine months in response to the crisis, uh, the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Think, think about what we did in relation to COVID. Uh, Todd Stern, who was the US climate envoy, said to me about five years ago, you know, it, are we acting as if, and this was before Don't Look Up, are we acting as if an asteroid is coming towards the Earth and we're going to act? Well, no, we're not. Um, <laughs> You know, with political will, genuine political will, I think the last few years have shown what is possible. And I think, I think Heather is so right. You are showing that another world is possible, and it's for all of us in other countries to also try and make it happen. Thanks. Heather? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on the, the kind of communications, the vision, and the public support. Um, because, you know, in this country and in many others, there is growing concern or there is consensus, but that can be fractured at times when the costs appear unfair for particular groups. And those groups themselves might say, no, it's not that I don't agree with net zero, it's that I just don't agree with this policy and therefore I won't, I'll vote against whoever the politician proposing it is. Um, so I think it is really important, therefore, for this vision and the communication to be quite honest about the many benefits so people actually understand them. I'm not convinced, actually, how many people fully understand the dangers of air pollution in London, how it damages their health, even like their education outcomes, etc. There's evidence on that. Um, but also honest about the cost and then setting up appropriate government support programs so that low, lower or middle income households who have faced a terrible cost of living crisis can actually access some of these technologies which actually are then very much associated with benefits. So currently it's unfair because richer people can afford the EV and then benefit from the low running costs or richer people can afford to insulate their homes and therefore have lower energy bills particularly in an energy crisis. So I think that whole communications has to be accompanied by the policies which can be communicated and people can actually understand that it's fair. Um, and part of that is about decentralisation. So sorry we didn't mention it much, but you know we have policy levers available to local governments in the UK. We're quite centralised and there could be more, but there are many programmes that can be implemented at the local level. Um, participatory decision making when it comes to community opposition to say infrastructure or when it comes to understanding the, the worker transitions involved, that those kinds of mechanisms are considered quite useful for actually making people feel engaged with the process and supporting So I, I'm aware we're quite over time, so I gave you last few words. Last uh, words. Yeah, uh, not much, uh, uh, but I, I want to emphasize that green industrial policy is much more difficult than designing and implementing the conventional industrial policy. You have always to bear the net zero goals, and then you have also to achieve growth and technological advances. So I want to highlight the complications, the complexity and difficulty. And to reduce this complexity, one possible way is policy learning. We know that technological learning is so important in firms. It equally applies that policy learning is important when it comes to governments, and this is also linked with the governance issue that was raised. Uh, a green industrial policy requires a different set of uh, uh, governance for green transition. Uh, the depths of, uh, uh, let's say, the way the co government collaborates and the firms is going to be different. 
and the society's role is going to be important uh, because they can influence uh, and put much pressure on government. So we also need to be that the governance needs to be quite different. Okay. Well, apologies for going over. I think it's worthwhile because it's been such an excellent discussion and set of presentations around the panel and the audience. So I've, I've been really stimulated and I hope you have. Thank you very much. And thank you for your Great job.